Time to good people. We back again. Riot Starter TV. It's always an honor and a pleasure to rock with you all um, on this beautiful day. Storming down here in Atlanta, but it's still beautiful. We're still on the planet, so that's cool with me. Um, you know, come on in, join us. You know, welcome to Black Power Media. If it's your first time coming through, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like all that good stuff they say on these YouTube streets. Um, I'm delighted to be able to uh, have our guests that we're having on here today but before i speak on them and invite them on i want to remind folks that it's black august it is the 43rd year commemoration of black august and black august is about commemorating political prisoners it's about um particularly those pr pr prisoners um, in the state of california um who lost their lives um folks like Tari golden folks like george jackson jonathan jackson uh, W.L. Nolan, uh, Alvin Juggs Miller, and Cleveland Edwards, to name a few. These are freedom fighters that we commemorate here in the U.S. Um, that were uh, assassinated in the state of California back in the 70s. You know, so, um, you know, we're fasting, we're training, we're studying, you know, and we are in the practice of liberation, we're in the practice of revolution. So I'd like to start off by saying Black August Resistance and the response is long live the dragon. So again, you know, it's uh you know, it's 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 Thursday here over on the East Coast. But one of our guests is coming on, you know, she's already already in Friday on Friday. She's like, you know what I mean, she ahead of time, you know, that's how far ahead she ready to do what she doing. You know what I'm saying? So um uh, we um uh, we're honored, you know, and I'm trying to allow you folks to come on in before we get busy you know shout out to all the good people out there that support what it is we're doing um stay tuned to blackpowermedia.org uh, you know if you're looking to um you know check out you know past episodes um also like i said subscribe to our youtube channel and we got some dope merch on there as well so make sure you check that out and um you know that's what it is uh so Without further ado, um, one of our guests we've had on a, a few months ago um, talking about the Rwandan genocide. You know, we remember the Rwandan genocide. You know, some of us, uh, as, as Dr. King would say, have a uh, six day memory, so they don't remember anything that mass media is not constantly pumping into their heads. So um, we want to be constant reminders as to, uh, you know, our victories. Um, and our struggles you know what i'm saying we're not going to say losses because we're not taking no losses uh there's battles and there's wars and you know we will be victorious ultimately against capitalism because we know capitalism is a very violent system capitalism uh, is a byproduct of violence and subjugation and you know our guests are going to talk about that here today um again you know uh my two guests they have a uh, a book. They are a part of a book project that was released recently. Uh, the name of the book is Survivors Uncensored, and it's about their plight and um, you know their experience over in Rwanda during this particular genocide. So, without further ado, I want to welcome to the Black Power Media audience and the Riot Starter TV audience, my man Claude. Get to bouquet. I don't know if I got his name right just yet. Yeah, I'm on point. I'm doing better. 
Yes, man, you did. Yeah. I appreciate it. Man, look here, man. I've been practicing in the mirror. I was like, yo, <laughs> if I don't get this right, Claw gun, you know what I'm saying? Make me wear the shirt that he got on right now. <laughs> but you've also you've also been fasting. No wonder you always look so neat and healthy. Oh, that's what it is. Uh, see, <laughs> see, yeah. see. I, I know that's how I know you're a friend of uh a good brother Kwame. Shout out to Kwame down here in Atlanta from uh Shout Friends of the Congo. Kwame. Yeah, Kwame, if you if you're watching this, you know, I, I I'm still looking for that check for shouting you out. So, you know, just know that. You know, we ain't tripping on that. But um, Claude, uh, like I said, you've been on before and uh, you know, folks learned a lot. This time you brought a friend. Can we introduce our good sister Delphine to the to the audience? Um, what's happening delphine how you feeling i'm good kalonji thanks for having us no doubt no doubt so delphine i'm gonna I'm make an effort mm -hmm. pronouncing your name <laughs> and i'm i'm gonna say uh yanda muso yeah good <laughs> i'm on point yes you are <laughs> i ain't want to get my african card snatched i want to make sure we on point around here anyway it's definitely a pleasure to have you on it's six o'clock in the morning well where, De where delphine is you're where are you uh delphine if you don't mind telling the audience yeah i'm in sydney in australia sydney australia yeah. we're definitely honored to have you on and have you getting up early in the morning you know what i'm saying and uh Thanks and for having me. yes 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 so you all got this new book out um i've been waiting for my copy claws has been mailing it since you know it came from the publisher you know <laughs> i think you said it pony <laughs> express we ain't gonna trip on that <laughs> Claude, like it's in the mail you know yeah, should have gotten it already i know i'm, I'm, I'm looking i'm like i don't got anybody book but yours i got some books that i don't even know why i got but it's all good but um i de definitely uh if you all don't mind um claude um please uh tell us you know why you're here and give us a uh, a brief description of um of this book that uh that everyone in our audience should own by the time we get off of this platform um and so would be uh the book itself uh the reason we're here is we we released the book uh the book is out on amazon it's called survivors uncensored it's actually written in two languages both uh, it's written in english it's also written in French. The French version is Sylvie Par la Parole. And they're both, um, uh, they're, it's on Amazon. It's the same book, same chapters, just different languages. And our purpose is to make sure that the world knows. You say it in the introduction, we ain't taking no losses. And that's exactly what we're doing. We ain't taking no losses. We are here to make sure that our stories are told by us. And what I want to basically highlight is what's actually new, because there's been a lot of books written about the Rwandan genocide, about Rwanda itself and everything. And what is different in this book? Um, first of all, it's it's one of the most comprehensive, most inclusive, non-discriminatory non-discriminatory collection of testimonies. Usually the way the Rwanda story is written or talked about is in a very ethnicized in a very ethno-fascist way where um, it's focusing on one ethnicity versus another when you're talking about the Rwandan genocide. Uh, this one is about people's experiences and at the expense of power hungry folks who uh, would do anything and everything to sell out the African sisters and brothers and in order to achieve that power. And one of the things that they use in some cases is, um, is um, ethnicity, uh, which is where the genocide comes in. Uh, people being wiped out on the basis of the ethnicity and especially, especially <clears throat> with the intent to exterminate them. This is something that happened to Tutsi people. This is something that happened to Hutu people. But usually what happens is um, when you talk about what's happened in Rwanda, a lot of it is left out. What is left out that we've got in this book are human experiences, what people lived through, showing um, what they lived through before the genocide. So before the Rwanda genocide, many times if, when you hear about the, the, the genocide, you think something happened in 1994 and all of a sudden a, a group of who, uh, extremist Hutus got up and started killing Tutsis. And uh, there was actually a four-year war 
leading up to it. We've got testimonies of people who lived in the areas under uh, siege for those four years. There was insecurity all over Rwanda. We've got testimony from people all over Rwanda that's talking about that. And then we talk about the genocide. Uh, a lot of it, is, it started with actually with the shooting down of the presidential plane that set off the genocide. There are many, uh, there's actually somebody who was in the meeting when they were planning to shoot the uh, the plane, who whose uh, part of this testimony is in the book also. Mm -hmm. um, there are stories of people who actually fled Rwanda and also suffered genocide inside of the Congo. We've got that. And then there, it's not just focusing on Rwandans, it's focusing on people who were affected. So there were people who were non-Rwandan who were in Rwanda when it happened, Burundians and Congolese, uh, who also share stories or who went after the uh, the genocide. Um, and those stories are all in there. It covers all ethnicities, all, all backgrounds, uh, um, socioeconomic backgrounds, political backgrounds, um, men, women. Uh, one thing that I noticed is that a lot of people who gave testimony in this book were actually, and it's a bunch of essays, it's over a hundred testimonies, essays, wow. short essays. So it's a summary of testimonies, but I, a lot of them were children um, and uh, they experienced horrible things. But the biggest thing that emerges in there is resilience, hope, and humanity. And uh, uh, Delphine, I don't want to hug the uh, microphone, but if I'm missing anything here, you know, please um, help me out. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and, the, and also, like you said, Claude, uh, the difference is that, um, you know, history, history doesn't discrim discriminate, uh, you know, and the experiences we've been through, uh, for example, wall, I, I always say, um, if someone starts shooting or if the bombs are, are, are coming, it's not going to discriminate. So why would we discriminate the history? Uh, and that's the difference in this book that uh, everyone has been through something, everyone has experienced uh, war and genocide. So we, we we try to capture all that uh, picture, the bigger picture without discriminating. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, just, just listening, you know, it brings me back to, you know, to our, our last interview, um, you know, when, when you were on here, Claude, <clears throat> you and, um, uh, our sister, what's our sister name that was on here with you? Uh, Na, Na, uh, Nadine Kazuba. She's also, Nadine, her yeah. story is in the book. She she co-authored a number of stories in the book. By the way, uh, since you give me the, the floor, I want to kick a shout out to one of our co-authors that I'm seeing in the comments, uh, Rujeni Janti. She's okay. also in the, I, I saw her in the comments. So I want to kick a shout out to all our co-authors, actually. There was okay. eight of us that contributed to the book in terms of our co-authors. Yeah. So, so, and no, and that, that I was going to ask you how many folks, but, um, you know, and I want to ask, uh, you know, because like I said, you know, just so many, uh, things are racing through my mind because, um, this story, one of the things Delphine talked about was, you know, our history and, and like you said, history, not discriminating history only discriminates when it's coming from the colonial regime when it's coming from uh, those who seek to uh, to to hide and to uh, and to to rewrite it and, and to mislead and to uh, Hollywoodize it, you know, for lack of better words. I want to ask you, uh, Nate, um, Delphine, what was the the process like for you? How did you get involved in um, in, in, you know, what qualified you as a as a co-author? Mm. Um, I've been involved from um, for a couple of years ago now, uh, since a couple of years ago when we started uh, opening up. And, and sometimes when it's say about we started opening up, people don't understand. Uh, but like Claude said, um, the the Rwandan narrative or the official narrative uh, is is one sided, and for so long uh, we were unable. Uh, to talk about some some stories, you know, some parts of the stories, especially like you said, for people who have had a hand in, you know, persecuting people or killing people or kill or chasing us or um, discriminating some people, they didn't want uh, the the stories to come out. So for so long we we've been you know silent or 
talking in the, in the little corners, but not publicly. Uh, but since a couple of years ago, when we started talking um, in uh, in a group uh, called uh, Liwaruwarida, it's Liwaruwara is like uh, only the person who lived the night can tell. So that group, we started talking about um, those other stories that are, are, are censored, let's say censored, are not talked about. And so um, I got involved in terms of uh, giving my, my own testimony. And, um, and also following that, I, I realized how much people have, had suffered in terms of, uh, you know, the hurt, the harm that have been done to, to, to people uh, for keeping silence, for, you know, not being able to tell what you've been through or having someone telling you that actually you're lying or telling you that you're a fake survivor. There's, you know, so many people have been called fake survivors or just denied uh, their rights to tell their stories. So I, I journeyed because uh, I am passionate about mental health and uh, storytelling and everything. Uh, so I started journeying with people to encourage or to support people who want to tell, who are ready ready because readiness is important as well who are ready to talk about what they've been through there's so many traumatizing uh, stories we, we've seen horrible stuff uh and it can be hard to to retell because somehow you re, you re, you're like reviving that um so i've been in that journey i've been helping some people to um to tell their stories and we've been doing some talks in terms of uh raising awareness because I, I, I couldn't know that, like I didn't know that, um, or sometimes you cannot imagine that some people don't know what uh, people have been through, especially refugees. So there's so many hi hidden stories and we've been journeying, we've been trying to bring it to, to, to light, you know, for everyone to know. Yeah, so that's how I became involved um, with the group and being a co-author. So I, I, I want to ask you, because, you know, the last time, you know, Claude, Claude and Nadine were on. They was they were kind of giving some accounts of of their experience and and what it was like for them uh, mm -hmm. during that particular time period. So if you don't mind sharing with our audience, um, and they're still going to buy the book, so don't worry about uh, you know doing up any <laughs> trade secrets. And I'll be whoop, I got her story, so we ain't gonna. <laughs> I should get five dollars off. Um, <laughs> we they, they, they're pretty cool. Shout out to the chat. Um, I, I mean, like, how old were you when this thing took place? And and for folks who are unfamiliar, because one of the things that one of the, the grave errors we make as organizers is, is sort of like what you what you spoke on a few seconds ago. You talked about how, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine that folks wouldn't know the stories of refugees. Right. But the the the, the fact is, unfortunately, you know, with it being eight billion people on this planet and us all being uh, particular African people and other, you know, uh, uh, marginalized and affected and impacted individuals, you know, it, it's always something going on. There's always some type of, you know, insanity, you know, so it's hard to capture all the stories. So yeah. for you, how old were you? And if you could just walk us back, what took place uh, during that faithful time, faint, um, fateful time uh, in 1994. Yes, um, and, and also before I start that is um, uh, also the the Rwandan government that goes through lengthy, like they do so much, they pay a lot of money to to stop the story spreading. So you I said think the that's London government? Area. Did yeah, the Rwandan the government. The Rwandan government. Oh, Rwandan government, okay. Yeah, yeah Rwandan, the Paul Kagame's uh, government. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I was just saying that, that uh, in addition to so much happening at the same time and so people not knowing, but also in, can you imagine someone trying, like making an effort to actually uh, making those stories disappear? Anyway, that's uh, that, that was a bracket. Uh, coming back to my to my story. So in 1994, I was uh, in April. I was nine. Uh, so um, hardly 10. And um, on the journey that like we, my family and I were living in, in the capital of Rwanda, Kigali. So it's obviously a long story, but long story short is um, we had to leave, we had to move because the war or the refugees were coming from a, a different side uh, towards like the same direction, like obviously running away from the bullets and, and bombs. 
Um, we moved uh, from Kigali, the capital city, toward the north of, um, of Rwanda and uh, towards Congo. So we ended up in Congo. I'm with my family and uh, my siblings, uh, my parents. Um, and uh, I remember we, we, we had to move we, in cars, but at a certain point there was stop. Like there was no way of, of driving. So we had to walk uh, all the way to Congo. Uh, we stayed in, um, in, in, uh, in north of Congo, in Goma, for a short, of a short period of time. And, and, and that period was hard as well for, for a nine years old who could see, because there was a period where we could see um, dead bodies, because there was um, like a, a coral pandemic, uh, what I think people said that it was like maybe some poison or whatever, I don't know. But seeing um, uh, dead bodies uh, tasked on, the, like a, a lined up on, on the road, um, that was traumatizing as well for me. That was the beginning of, or, you know, not the beginning, but really things were escalating. Um, we stayed in, in Goma for some time and then we went to north of, uh, of Congo as well, like in Ruchuru. Uh, we stayed for a little while in a, in a you know, residential area like with, other, with the Congolese. Uh, but shortly after, there was some sort of campaign that everyone had to go in refugee camps. So we moved, we had to go to a refugee camp and we, we, we resided in a, a refugee camp called uh, Katale. For people who've been there, people who've been refugees in, in Congo, they will probably uh, remember the name. And um, we didn't stay for too long because uh, as soon as we would start some sort of normality to go back to our routine, something would happen. And that's how in 1996, um, the refugee camps were invaded uh, by the RPF soldiers. Uh, RPF um, is uh, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, uh, the, is the current regime. So the soldiers invaded, invaded um, the camps. So it was, it, it happened just suddenly because uh, obviously we didn't see it coming. And um, uh, I remember that it was night time because they, I guess it was strategic for them to 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 to, to start or to bomb uh, the camps during the night. And I can remember the chaos, the, the, the people running uh, into direct, every direction and not knowing what to do, not knowing what to take, uh, not knowing where to go. And um, Obviously, as children, we had to follow our parents' uh, or everyone's actually everyone's uh, direction. Everyone was running from like away from the bullets. Um, so we journeyed from the refugee camps to like a, like a forest, you know. So through it, it's a long journey from the refugee camp through the forest. I can't even remember the names, um, but through all that running away from the bullets and. Um, you know, RPF soldiers killing pretty much everyone and everything they could, you know, go across. Um, and later on, uh, after, like, I, I don't know how long we stayed in there, I cannot be precise, but um, we ended up coming back. Uh, there was, um, it was, because the situation was becoming very dangerous. And by the time we got out of the uh, we had we had already separated like my family and my siblings my two siblings we had already we were and mom we were already separated with dad we didn't know where that was and we had already lost um, my older brother until now we never um, we don't know what happened to him so that was uh, the journey um, we came back because uh, mom realized that she had you know young children and things were bad and um, we heard that there was some people were, were you know being returned and there was some uh, transport for people to come that's how there was some ngos you know as a child i was just you know i could see things i remember so much so much that i saw uh, but at the same time I had to follow the parents rules so we, we came back to rwanda that's um the short of it in terms of congo but also shortly um i can also mention that um my like my dad is, was from from the north, so we we had to come. Everyone who was a refugee when they returned, they had to go back to their uh, their place of origin. Um, so we stayed in, in in the north, like at my grandparents, 
um, and shortly after there was an insurgency. So every all these stories and similar stories in terms of insurgency are in the book as well. Um, but there was another insurgency in 1998 in the north. So we had to run again, and um, that's that's another story um, that was traumatic for me as well because. Um, we had a time where I was just me and my younger brother. We had to run. We had to, you know, we couldn't stay. We couldn't stay in our ho in our house um, because it was so dangerous. We could we we could not stay. We could not say who we were because everyone, you know, was pretty much targeted. So it was it was a really hard time for me. As I said before, as soon as we start to have some normal normal routines, normal lives something would happen. So yeah, that was, I think that's a shot of it. I don't know if um, it's hard to retell the whole journey, obviously, in a short time. But um, yeah, there was so, so much yeah. that um, happened. Yeah. No, you, you, you know, you, I mean, you gave us, definitely gave us a vivid story. How old was your, uh, your older brother? My older brother. So he was um, uh six years older than me so he would have been uh, about 16 17 at the time and you said yeah, you still haven't heard back. anything as far as whatever happened to him no well, we, no and then, yeah yeah well we, we we pray that you know that uh somehow you are reunited in the in the uh in the, in the best way you know definitely mm. uh, definitely appreciate um you sharing the story um i want to ask uh you claude um i know that you know, from my understanding is many stories in the book from what you all are telling me about around genocide and atrocities. Um, I want to know, um, you know, what is it like, you know, when when a uh, war breaks out and, you know, attackers are intentionally looking to wipe you out. They're looking to decimate you. You know what I mean? Because listening to to Delphine, it's like, you know, being here. I grew up in the projects, right, in, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And, you know, I'm used to, to to gunfire and all that type of stuff. But listening to what you are talking about, that's like, you know, it's folly and child's play. You know what I'm saying? Not that any any uh, any violence uh, is, is, is worse than any violence when it comes to the individual. But I, I want to know, like, what is, uh, you know, what was that like? I mean, because it's... You know, I'm sure there are people that that's checking us out, like that are thinking that this is it's insane that other human beings can do this to other human beings, particularly other Africans. You know what I'm saying? So can can you speak on that? Yeah. Um, so uh, just to give the audience a little bit of um, um, context, or maybe just to put a bow on uh, Delphine's story, what she just gave is basically a summary of ten years of her childhood from 1990 to, she talked about the insurgency in 1998. So that's eight years, not exactly 10 years. And just imagine a child living through stuff like that. So um, <clears throat> for me, when it all started, I was 10 years old. And um, at first I didn't actually experience it other than um, like the explosions. So you're talking about the violence in the, in the, in the, or the rough life in, in the projects. When we first came to the U.S., we also lived in the projects, one of the roughest um, areas of Nashville in, in North Nashville. And, um, you know, there was issues, there was violence. But for me, when I got to it at first, I said, you know what? This place is so quiet. Uh, <laughs> you, even, because, even with the violence. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Because like, oh, there's only uh, two gunshots. Right. <laughs> yeah, That's just crazy. a few, a few yeah. shots a night, you know. Right. We could deal um, with that. Yeah. But like Kigali was like that for years, for years, um, where on a nightly basis there was gunfire, there was explosions in the markets, there was explosions. This was going on during the war, so the fear started before the real explosion. Then, um, April 6, 1994, there was a shooting of the Rwandan president, um, at the time, which is what started and sparked that genocide. And Starting that day, there were explosions everywhere um, in the city of Kigali. Kigali is the capital of Rwanda. And I heard people screaming, dogs were barking, all kinds of animal uh, sounds at the beginning. 
and everybody was so scared. I was scared. Um, I remember like my stomach was bubbling. I was shaking. I was pacing back and forth. I was like, I, you know, I gotta go pee and I can come on back, running back. And I mean, it's like things were crumbling all over around me. Um, and you were how old, uh, Clark, just for the record? At, that, at this time. time, now I'm describing, at this time I'm 14. Okay. Um, that I'm describing. And so this is after four years of actually uh, war going on. Now, uh, when this, um, when this, all these explosions uh, started, like I said, there was all kinds of sounds. At one point, even the animals were afraid um, and they, um, they stopped making noise. You stopped hearing dogs bark or anything like that. The smell and the stench of the place of decomposing human flesh was all over the place, plus the smoke, plus like the, the, the crumbling structures, the dust, the whole air was like covered with a big dark mushroom. Um, and for me, some of it, some of what you're talking about being attacked and being targeted, it was actually very up close and personal. There was a time when um, we had to flee our house, first of all, uh, because people would come into our house looking for us to kill us when, when we first took, uh, went into hiding. But then when we started fleeing the city of Kigali, which is, so I can, now I can describe the war scene. Explosions started going, at first those explosions were not actually very, very close to us. But then when they started hitting where we were, you start running and you actually see people falling, getting hit. And there's like indiscriminate shooting and people are falling left and right. And um, when we fled the city of Kigali, at one point uh, we got stopped at so many places and they threatened to kill us. We were seeing these dead bodies that Delphine was describing. But at one point they actually selected me and my mother uh, and took us to a spot and made us dig our own grave because they wanted to, they say that they want to make sure that they, um, that they, that they uh, buried us after killing us. Um, so it was very upfront uh, and up close and personal. I, 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 um, want you to, I want you to repeat what you said. You said because of the fact that, you know, I've, I've heard you speak on this before, but um, you said it so casual. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people are surprised. Right. A lot right. of people are surprised. They're like, oh, he says that calmly. Right. But so and and, and, and and it's not like I'm I'm not making light of it. I'm 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 saying that I need you to tell these folks again that here it is, not only are you experiencing this type of uh, trauma and not just trauma, I don't think trauma is a I don't think there's a word in the English language to describe what what you all experience, um, but this terror, you know what yeah. I mean? And then on top of that, they they're already telling you that they're going to kill you and they have you and your mother digging your own graves. I yep. mean, let's talk. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to so, cut you off. It's just, I mean, I can describe the scene. Um, uh, at this place, we were traveling from Kigali to um, the city of Kigali to Western Rwanda, uh, to a town of Gisenyi, which is right next to the Goma town that Delphine was talking about in Congo. Um, but to get there, we had to go through multiple checkpoints. We survived many of these uh, checkpoints. Uh, some, and at each one of the checkpoints, we didn't simply survive. Somebody came and intervened. Somebody came and said, you know what? Leave these people alone. Uh, don't kill them. And uh, at um, this, one, this one checkpoint, they actually came up. It was a little pickup truck that we were on. They came up. And they said, um, they pointed at me and my mother and they took me to one side of the street. They took my mother to the other side of the street. I remember the guy like it was yesterday. He looked me in the eyes and he says, say goodbye to life. And, and this is a I grown man thinking, talking to you as a child. This is a grown man talking to me. And, um, I started pleading with him because I knew that they were serious. Anytime they say that this is the end, it was the end. And um, they ordered the pickup truck to leave. That was another sign that you're done. It's, you know, your life is over. Um, 
But these militias selected us, they identified us as Tutsis and wanted to kill us. They took us away from the street to a little carpentry shed. It was actually surrounded by um, by some um, bamboo, uh, like a, a little bamboo forest. There was a little carpentry shed and there was it was raining and water was dripping off of the um, off of the, the the roof, like basically like a scene from the movie, except there was no music. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of people in the area rushed in. They came running. This is why, um, actually, I think it's important that you give platforms like this for survivors to speak. It's why I think it's important that a book like this actually um, is out telling the stories of survivors. And for everybody that actually gives a voice to survivors, I am very grateful because speaking out is so important. Um, what happened was these strangers came. Um, I was actually speaking to my mom the other day and she, she reminded me that one of the people, the very first people that came was an old drunk man who started cursing these young men that wanted to kill, kill us. And then a bunch of neighbors came. A bunch of neighbors uh, rushed in mostly women and some children and they started yelling at them saying hey stop don't kill these people leave them alone and um as they were doing that that's actually who they ordered us to say they said go borrow some shovels and holes from those people dig your own grave because we gotta kill you we gotta uh, bury you after we kill you so they told you to go borrow some shovels yes. and holes yes uh, go and borrow some shovels and holes to dig your own grave correct that is what happened. And I, I was standing there with my mother. At first, I was horrified. I was afraid. I was so scared. Then all of a sudden, um, I went numb. My mother asked me, are you scared? I said, no, I'm not feeling anything. Um, and so I was resigned to death at that time. The truck driver, by the way, on the truck was my two sisters and a little cousin that we were fleeing, uh, we were fleeing Kigali with came back, which was very unusual. He brought a guy, a man, the first time, and he left. The guy stayed there and negotiated for us. I remember some of the things that they said. Um, by the way, I just reconnected with the children of this man um, who, who came to negotiate the first time. He said, come on, leave these people alone. You see how far they've traveled? You know, they're almost home and everything because my father's um, my father is from the, 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 the western, northwestern part of uh, Rwanda. And they looked at him and they said, well, do you know that the one of the leaders of the RPF, which is the the, the rebel group that was fighting the Rwanda government at the time, led by Paul Kagame, this man, they say this man named Pastor Bizimungu is actually from a couple of hills away from here. And they say, it doesn't matter if they're from here. We're going to kill them. And if you, you two continue to get in the way, we'll kill you too. The man didn't leave. And the driver came back and brought another person. And both of the men, they, they stayed there and negotiated and negotiated for hours. We got in this place. It was mid-afternoon, maybe around 2 or 3 p.m. It was pitch black when the second man that came said, you know what? This boy and his mother are not going to make it five miles from here let somebody else kill them somehow they agreed to that they let us get back on the truck everybody was so scared people had been crying and praying and they were so excited to see us uh, my my sisters and my little cousin were crying i mean they they were completely desperate thinking that we were done at that place at first when i was still feeling things before i was numb i felt i was scared i was horrified but the thing that i felt the most was I felt lonely, even though I stayed, I was stand, standing there with my mother. I felt lonely because what was happening to us, I felt that the world would never know. And I vowed that first I wanted the world to know, regardless of whether I survive or not. Once I survived, I vowed that we would make sure that the world knows what happens and we, the world must know what happened to everybody. So when you ask the question, why was black why were black people killing black people for me it's always it goes to for me it goes to white supremacy you have it's easier and better and it looks better when you have black people killing black people than if you have 
white people coming in with their guns and shooting up the black people. And it's easy to sell people out using people like Museveni and Kagame and their opponents at the time to gang up on us, the regular people, and just kill us in order for them to get a little piece, a breadcrumb from, uh, from white supremacy. For me, that's what it is. It's still happening today. The stories that we're talking about have not ended because there are still things going on in Rwanda, things like sexual abuse of women, using women to spy on, on people uh, and, and giving sexual favors, forcing them into sexual favors. You know, those type of things are still happening. That conflict has been exported into the Congo. Today, the Congo is in conflict. What is happening is the exploitation of the resources of the Congo and the region to satisfy the appetite of many around the world. So that's what it is in a nutshell when it comes to, you know, why are black people holding machetes and killing each other, you know, ordering children to dig their own graves, um, you know, storming into refugee camps like Delphine, I know Delphine's story includes the invasion of the refugee camps in the Congo and the chaos. Um, so all of that for me is, um, is what one of the um, one of the stories in the book. One of the authors or the the survivors said, uh, "She, it's a woman, a young woman." She said, "Then she was very young when it happened." She said, "You know what? I've decided to take my my pain and turn it into my power. And what we are doing, what we've done, is to take our pain and not be victims, but be survivors." and make sure that our stories are out and that we are saying this uncensored, regardless of every effort, as Delphine said, by the government of Rwanda, by Paul Kagame, who pays so much money to keep everybody silent, to keep us silent, and in fact, in some cases, even kidnap or kill people um, for simply uh, sharing their stories. Uh, but we don't share our stories for people to feel sorry for us. We don't share our stories to depress people. We share our stories to, in, to, to, to empower people and to, um, um, I'm losing the word, it's to inspire, to inspire right. people so that yeah. we can take action, so that we can own our future because somebody owned our past. Now we're going to take it and we're going to own our future. I, I want to, um, and, and I, I got to say, like, you know, I, I've done hundreds of interviews, you know what I'm saying? To say the least, you know, literally um, so many, so much. So I've forgotten a lot of them, but while you were speaking and while Delphine was, uh, you know, uh, giving us an, an account and recounting um, your stories, I mean, I needed you to keep on talking because I had to literally fight back myself. You know what I'm saying? Just, I mean, because it's, it's. I mean, not to sound corny, but it's, it's heart wrenching. You know what I'm saying? It, it's like this criminal enterprise that is, has, that, that's man, the, the manipulation tactics are so calculated that even even the greedy rats amongst us will do whatever they have to do including decimating their own including annihilating their own exterminating their own without missing a beat you know what i'm saying if, if there is a such thing as a hell, I pray that all of those involved, um, you know, that, that, that they burn in, in a way that, 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 that it's unimaginable because this is pure evil. This is evil at its finest. And, and again, that's why I say capitalism represents evil. Capitalism is violence capitalism confuses people into thinking that it's something that is not and in order for it to strive and thrive there has to be bodies you know 
one of the things you talked about last time is um, you talked about, and, and I've seen pictures of of skulls. I've seen pictures of, of, of bones stacked up as if it was some type of ritual or like it was a collection. Um, Delphine, can, can you speak to that? I mean, did you witness a lot of, I know that uh, Claude talked about a, a lot of bodies and I, I don't wanna, and, and for the, 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 the viewers and for our guests, I'm not trying to uh, invoke anything. I'm, I'm trying to get a vivid, clear picture as to why we must oppose oppression and domination wherever it exists. We must eradicate it. You know, you can't call yourself a freedom fighter. You can't call yourself a human without opposing this type of uh, treachery. So, I mean, you know, you as a child, I know that, like you said, you know, it was traumatic. I, I can't even imagine. Um, tell us about it. What was, you know, Kalanji, Kalanji, Delphine, please, one second. Uh, no, Kalanji, you said you're still waiting for your copy. Are you sure you haven't gotten your copy? Because there's also stories about these bones and stuff in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. see, see, that's how I know you relate to Kwame. Now, right, Kalanji's just a good interviewer. Give me my props. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Delphine. No, no, like Claude. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, it, it's like, you, you know what just happened to you? There, there are no words there's there's no way of describing it that's it you know um and, and i think uh as, as a child I, like i can't even imagine how we went through it and some children were even younger than me like my brother was you know younger than me um so i think most of the time the parents or the, the grown-ups try to sort of make us look the other way or sort of to to protect us from seeing much but also i think our, our body or some some parts of our brains they protect protect us in terms of like um i don't know they had some of those images some way but um you know what we've seen i, I guess uh, apart from what i, I mentioned that like, like body is literally like stacked on on uh, on the road you know um my brain doesn't want to re re review or remember most of some of the other stuff um but um it, it, it was horrible like 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 claude said before you know uh the fear the 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 this the, the confusion because as a child like what's going on you can't you, you can't even imagine what's going on and before you, you even ask a question there's no time to answer your questions but also maybe no one is understanding or no one can also that like, could tell you what's going on um so i i think i'll I'll let Claude talk about this, but also what you were saying is um, um, the display. I don't know if that's what you were talking about, but the display of the bones and the bodies uh, in in Kigali, it's um, it, it's a whole different story. Claude, um, can you yeah. please talk about that? Yeah, I think to talk about that is uh, I would use the story of Ivan Idamangi, uh, a genocide survivor. Uh, by the way, as we said earlier, not everybody that survived these genocides is actually recognized as a genocide survivor because the government of Rwanda only designates those that fit its narrative as genocide survivors. So she wait, 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 wait. So, you, <laughs> so yes. you, you're telling me or you're telling us that the government themselves get to dictate who is and who isn't a survivor? They do that, but we know, and that's part of the purpose of this book. We know what a survivor is. We know what surviving is. They tell you you didn't even survive. You just, you know, <laughs> right, right. You don't fit the criteria. So, you know, so they call us fake survivors. Shout out to uh, to you and I talk show host uh, Louise Watcho. I, I saw her in the in the comments. She's also been designated as a, a fake survivor. Uh, many of us who are who refuse to just run with the official narrative i could go with a part of my story and just fit exactly into the official narrative and they would be so happy and they i'm sure they will celebrate me as a survivor that the government accepts as a survivor in fact some of the stories in the book talk about how some of these survivors were never never received benefits for you know that that uh, genocide orphans and widows would receive because again they didn't fit in the official narrative 
uh, there is at least one story of a young man who was picked up as a baby among dead bodies. He doesn't know his ethnicity, but because they cannot prove that he's Tusi, he cannot receive, he could not receive the benefits. Um, he doesn't know where he was born. He doesn't know his parents. He doesn't know anybody. Um, and he is not even considered a, an official um, uh, survivor. So uh, back to uh, your question. <clears throat> Yvonne Idamange is actually a, a, a woman of 43 years old now, I believe. So she was a child also during the genocide, you know, 28 years ago. She survived the genocide. She actually went through, she, she, she benefited from the various, you know, the, the genocide benefits. But last year, 2021, January 31st, she started speaking out on YouTube she only lasted 15 days. One of the things that she said was, the remains of our families, the bones of our people who were killed in these genocides should not be displayed uh, and, and commercialized um, and that people should be buried and, um, and, and, and put to rest in peace. Um, <clears throat> she was arrested. February 15th, so 15 days later, just two weeks after opening that YouTube channel and doing a handful of shows. She was arrested, she was very popular because she was denouncing a lot of the injustices in the country anyway, from inside of the country, from the belly of the beast. Mm. She, she, she was arrested on February 15th. One of the charges against her was, um, was that, um, she is minimizing the genocide. She was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Right now, today, she's serving a prison sentence. She's been tortured. When she's on her periods, they don't let her clean. They don't let her clean up, which, of course, um, you know, one of the things that happened is just like not just horrible torture, which you also see in the book, but also the use of sexual violence as a, as a weapon against women especially. And so, you know, here she is right now in prison. She's been there for a year and a half now, because it was February, now it's August, 2022, a year and a half later. She's serving 15 years for simply speaking out, including the fact that she said, do not display the bones of people. You asked the question about displaying the bones of people. Uh, there is another story of, of, of a survivor in, in, in the book, or many, I can't remember, but I do remember one in particular that also talks about that and says, no, our families should be buried and laid to rest in peace. So so that's all I wanted to add to what Delphine was saying, but I really wanted to also honor and, and highlight and center uh, this, uh, this woman, uh, Yvonne Idamange. Um, now, on the use of the genocide as how long a has she been locked up um just when, when a, year and and a, a year and a half now a year and a half now. so yeah. this is this is and she was you know for for the record you're saying she's she was still in rwanda yes and she opened up this youtube channel yes and 15 days later they they, they snatch her up and yeah. now she's doing 15 years yes wow I'm only sorry. speaking now yeah, yeah. There is another, I do want to highlight one more story because, um, you know, these, when they weren't out for us to be able to get their stories, you know, maybe one day um, their stories will come out in English and uh, in other languages so that the world will know their stories. Um, you know, I call him our big brother. His name is Imable Karasira. Uh, he's a musician. Uh, he's, uh, he was a university professor. He's a survivor of um, genocide. And... Um, he is also in prison today. He's been in pretrial detention since May of last year. He has not been sentenced. He's been, everything he's been accused of is a nonviolent crime, but they would not let him actually um, even stay out of prison, you know, to, to, to go through his case. One of the charges against him is genocide uh, denial and minimizing the genocide. Why? Because... He did survive the genocide in 1994, but after the genocide, Kagame and the RPF killed the rest of his family. And because he talks about that and does not stick with the official narrative, now he's accused of uh, 
denying the genocide and minimizing the genocide and his and so I just wanted to send a, to center those two survivors. Uh, there are many others, but I wanted to center those two because they also have spoken out and they've helped us in liberating ourselves and continuing to speak out. I want to I want to um, ask you all because um, of course uh, uh, Paul Kagame has this um, this mythical. Um, um, bile, for a lack of better words, and there are many people in the West who uh, support him and has supported uh, that particular regime. I want to ask you, um, and this is for either one of you, what role has, you know, because you, you mentioned white supremacy, what role has the West played in this genocide and this ongoing uh, um, torture and who's coming to the aid of the Rwandans? Because you're saying that this just took place um, a year and a half ago where this sister was uh, sentenced to 15 years for something that happened damn near 30 years ago, mm -hmm. 28 years ago to be exact. I mean, what what what's what's the deal? I mean, you know, I mean, is the UN coming in saying, hey, you know, this is an atrocity. Is, is NATO saying, you know what? You know, we want to help these folks. Is is this new Negro general that's heading up Africom? Is he coming in saying, look, we can't go for this? You know, is 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 Biden? You know, uh, you know, is he, is he talking about coming through. I mean, what's happening? Talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we know Andrew Young's position because he, 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 you know. yes, yes, yeah. yes. And I'd like you to talk no, about him too. No, but don't make me clown Atlanta. You know, hey, ATL, hey, you know, it's cool. I, I just live here, man. <laughs> <laughs> don't, be, don't be set tripping. We both in the US. <laughs> yeah. The Go former ahead. mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young, comrade uh, and you know, deputy of MLK, is actually his his firm, Goodwill International. I have receipts uh, or invoices where Paul Kagame was paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to to get lobbying services from Goodwill International. Um, Andrew Young is one of the people that supports um, that supports uh, Paul Kagame. The the Clintons are you know very tight with Kagame. He used to speak at the Clinton Global Initiative (CGI) um, all the time. Um, he's, he's very tight with Tony Blair and and many of these uh, the 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 the, the so-called world leaders. And um, <clears throat> if I could just take it back a little bit, and then I'll give it, turn it over to you, Delphine. Um, what does you know white supremacy, neo-colonialism have to do with this? We start with it goes way back to colonialism when the borders of Rwanda were cut up and um, one of the things that happened, even though Rwanda was an organized society that already had, you know, the the kings that ruled the rest of the population and everything, um, and there was Hutus and Tutsis and Twas, which are also in the region everywhere, in every country surrounding Rwanda. When they came, one of the things that they did was to introduce an identity card. And let me just, uh, the identity card looked something like this. And <clears throat> this identity card inside of the ID card is, um, it actually has a person's ethnicity uh, designated in it. This was introduced in 1933 by the Belgians. So during the genocide, um, when, for example, they would look for people to kill, they would check their IDs because it's hard to tell a black person from another black person, especially Rwandans who have intermixed for de uh, for, for decades and, and centuries. Um, and um, <clears throat> that was one of the legacies of colonialism that was a part of this uh, the, the genocide and these atrocities. What we have today, when I talked about Andrew Young and the Bill Clintons and, you know, um, the West, the US, the UK, much of the European Union supporting Kagame, and by the way, um, including Canada and Australia, um, those are that's who actually supports Paul Kagame. If somebody people like Paul Kagame 
and of course you're waiting Museveni and others in 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 the region and around the world you had uh, you had Mobutu also in the Congo uh, you had so many all over the continent um, there's still some or many today without the support of the West the people would actually overthrow them and set themselves up for you know to to manage their own affairs but because they have the guns you know Rwanda, a place like Rwanda, a place like Uganda, and so many other countries do not have the economies to actually carry out these wars. They do not have factories that, that actually manufacture guns and bombs and tanks and all of these other things that you need for wars. So they get the support from the West. And that's the neocolonialism does not just stop at simply arming Black people to kill Black people. It's exploitation of black people is exploitation of the lands displacing people was happening you know what happened in rwanda it was exported into the congo and the congo is being exploited today big time um, where villages are displaced so that multinational companies can set up their um their 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 um mining concessions many of the companies there is a, a website uh conflictminerals.org many of the companies from there are Canadian, for example. Um, there are some that are American, British, French, Belgian. There's even South African companies um, <clears throat> and many Australian companies also. That is what neocolonialism is doing, the exploitation and the, um, the pillaging of the resources in Africa by first, and especially in Central Africa, this part of the world that we're talking about, and at first displacing the people and then taking over the lands, mining the lands, taking the resources, giving a cut to the local plantation managers, the Kagamis and the Musevenis, and taking the resources uh, to, to, to basically make a big profit off of it. So Delphine, I'm sorry, I was a little bit long-winded there, but I, I wanted to kind of give the full picture. Yes, I know that's good. Thanks, Claude, for that bigger picture. But also, I wanted to come to the other side, um, the other part of the question in terms of who's who's coming to uh, to Rwanda's aid, who's who's doing what, like what's happening. Uh, it's it's a long story, but uh, and it's it's so unfair because uh, for so long, you know that that war um, has been happening in Congo, and um, those NGOs, I mean when you read the, the book um, some of the stories talk about how as refugees were going through that are being chased through you know different parts of congo uh, the ngo some of the ngos um had um you know would sort of they would gather people you know they would gather refugees uh, and they would you know call them like we need to give the, you something to eat and everything though there, there are drones everywhere uh, they have images they have pictures of what actually happened they know they know what happened uh, and also it, it's another sad thing is that after they've gathered them they've told them they're, they're going to give them food uh shortly after the rpf soldiers will come and decimate all of them so it would be like a, i don't know it was a strategy to gather them you know so who's doing what in that in that sense you know there's there's uh, some this conspiracy there's some that people have like those refugees is like they were sold like to be killed really um but also coming back to that all that history is documented and also the un like you're talking about un has um done they've done it themselves because they discovered some mass graves in congo and it triggered um a un uh, mapping report exercise they have records of you know some of the the crimes that were you know perpetrated they have evidence they have a lot they have a, like a huge it's a very thick document and it's been in 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 un shelves for over 10 years there's a, a whole bunch of recommendations they haven't been followed none of them have been followed they haven't even opened those that record that, that you know report you know that's that's you know it tells a lot it tells a lot uh the recently because like we were saying uh I hope I'm hoping that one day people will will show or will know how um, it was like a, a plan for them to to send or to send refugees towards Congo from Rwanda towards Congo so that later on they can invade Congo saying that they are trying to get their genocidaires so that they can have a way in. 
that's something that is yet to be proven, but that's something that we've heard. Um, and and na until now, no one wants to actually do much about it to stop that wall. Like recently, like there was another report. There's so many reports, but they're just reports. No one is actioning them. Um, and for example, you know, people have been talking, we've been talking about what's been happening to Kong in Congo uh, since the refugees until now nothing much has been happening in terms of uh, actions. But look, when we say, for example, uh, Russia and Ukraine, like there's the whole world shakes, that everyone runs to, to, to provide support. So there's, um, I guess we are the ones, the Rwandans or Africans are the ones who are coming to their own aid. Um, the West is, I don't know, is, fueling yeah. the, the, the conflict because everyone has their interest. Everyone wants a piece of that Congo and the neighbors are suffering for that. And unfortunately, um, those, you know, the leaders who are, are being used, they don't care about their people. So that's, I don't know if there's another way of saying this, but that's, I don't think there's any aid coming from anyway. You have to be, it's us who need to, to do something about it or who need to raise, to raise awareness about what's happening and to, uh, actually denounce all those people who are hiding be behind um, all the groups, you know, so that, like Claude talked about it before, they make it look as it's like Rwandans killing Rwandans, but there's so many people behind the scenes, yeah. I, I don't know if uh, Claude, if you can yeah. uh, add anything on that, yeah. yeah. Delphine, I think what you're saying here, there is uh, actually a film called, um, it's called Crisis in the Congo uncovering um uncovering the truth by friends of the congo the film i i recommend everybody go out and watch that film it's it's 26 minutes it's on youtube you can actually uh you'll learn a lot about what we are saying here in that film uh comrade maurice carney of friends of the congo says there is a global conspiracy that says it is okay for 6 million black Africans to die and no one does anything about it. Um, and as Delphine said, not only are they making reports, but we also have testimony in the book where people were being intentionally starved so that they can actually uh, flee uh, and or actually so that they can stop fleeing and be captured by Rwandan troops and sent back to Rwanda. In addition, um, in April, on April 13th, 2010, Paul Kagame in parliament was swearing in his military leaders, including some of the most notorious ones in the Congo, General James Kabarebe, General Charles Kayonga, and a couple of others. And Kagame himself said, we went into the Congo and we shot the ones we wanted to shoot and we repatriated the ones we wanted to repatriate. Six months later, the UN mapping report was released talking about the same exact thing and he denied it. And what's in that report says that if taken to court, the Rwandan troops will be found to have committed genocide in the Congo during those years. But you know, um, when the invasion of Libya happened by NATO, you asked about NATO. Now I want to talk about the UN starving people, intentionally starving people so that they can go back to to the hands of Kagame, um, the when when NATO invaded Libya, they said that Gaddafi was intent on um, he was intent on committing genocide. So he hadn't done it. He was intent on committing genocide, and they went and invaded the um, invaded uh, Libya. Now. For me, me personally, I do not advocate on invading an African country. I do not want to see Western troops in an African country. But Kagame still receives support from the U.S., from the from many of the NATO countries, in spite of that UN mapping report, in spite of this uh, uh, recent report that shows that Rwandan troops are invading the Congo, causing mayhem, in spite of all of this, people like Kagame and Museveni and many others around the continent, by the way, but we're focusing on Rwanda in the region and these atrocities that we survived in this book. The, um, 
there is all of this silence, but this silence is complicity. It's not ignorance, it's not not knowing, it's complicity. But the more we talk about it, the more we expose it, the more they will have no choice, but to um, at least pretend like they're acting or at least leave us alone so that we can act on our own and do our thing and 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 take our affairs into our own hands. Like, like the song goes all the way, all around the world, same song. Um, I'm, I'm listening to you uh, talk about, and we, you know, of course, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, being lighthearted when it comes to the UN and NATO. We know that they are um, international police. Um, and just like the police here in the United States, they don't give two shits about Africans anywhere on the planet. In fact, we know that um, they've had their hand in not only uh, NATO with with uh, Gaddafi, but also uh, the UN with Patrice Lumumba. You know, so they we know that they've always aided on, um, you know, aided in our destruction, and they know we know that they are they are running dogs for the United States and Western interests, right? So we're clear about that. So I just want to point that out. But um, you know, just listening. Of course, you know, as organizers, you know, this is like, you know, duh, this is what it is. You know what I mean? The, you know, the, just the, 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 um, the whole idea of policing on a global level is a criminal act in and of itself. You know, the fact that, like you said, you know, we don't want Europeans, any Europeans or, or Asians or anyone else invading an African country, uh, we don't want them invading African communities in any parts mm -hmm. of the world. You know what I mean? But we know that, you know, that's the, the nature of the beast for lack of better words. Um, I want to ask, uh, what is the lasting solution to uh, the international conspiracy um, taking lives in the Great Lakes region of Africa? Um, you know, what, 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 what's that impact? What, what's, what, what's it looking like? I, I think the, the starting point is accountability. You know, it's it's um, it's justice, you know, and our people have been yearning for justice. So the very first thing we are actually taking justice into our our own hands by owning our own stories, because the very first thing that happens in order to to take control of any situation, especially when it comes to these political issues, it's who owns the narrative? What is the narrative? And so the more we own our own stories, um, the more we are freeing ourselves. Uh, secondly, it's we've got to look at this whole thing um, in terms of, so the, 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 the local merchants of death, absolutely. You say that you want them, if there is anything like hell, um, that they should burn as, you know, and everyone, that everyone that's involved should burn. We also want them to actually, for me as a survivor, and I hate imprisonment, but I would like to see some of these people actually walking away in handcuffs uh, to, to think about what they've done, to think about what they've done to our people, you know, for the rest of the, you know, for, for whatever amount of time that they spent before. For me, it's for the rest of their lives. Number you're, two, you're a kind man by saying that. You know what I mean? <laughs> You are, you are a kind man. I, I would be more on uh, Himurabi's code of law since this is what you wanted to do. You know, <laughs> let's bring that pain back to you. But I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I want him to 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 actually live with it and 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 think about it. And and um, the, secondly, it's our ability to actually economically develop ourselves that which is going to require revolution. You know revolting against these uh, the, the local uh, plantation managers and also revolting against the um, <clears throat> this global conspiracy, conspiracy and really taking a hard stance and saying, like the Ethiopians say, no more. You know, the hashtag no more. We have to say no more. We have to own our own affairs. We have to own our econ economics and become equal trading partners if that is what is desired by the world. Otherwise, still exploit our own resources to benefit 
the children of Mama Africa, which for me, the children of Mama Africa are all of us, not just those of us born on the continent, but all of us who are descendant of the continent. But justice is the very first thing. Justice is the very first thing in terms of lasting peace. And you know what? I'll give it, I'll give out a clue. Start with the recommendations of the mapping, the UN mapping exercise report. How about that? That will actually get that region going. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and it's like, you know, even with the the pain and suffering that you that you've all spoke about, there's still a sense of mercy coming from you. And 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 I must say that I think that um one of the problems that we as African people have is that we are so merciful with our enemies. You understand what I'm saying? We, 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 that, yeah. that has been, that has been tradition. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's, that's how we were created. You understand what I'm saying? But, you yeah. know, but, but you know, it, it is, uh, yeah. So, I'm definitely so, not preaching. I'm not preaching forgiveness without accountability. I'm not even preaching uh, forgiveness, which is a word that's usually thrown out to the people who've suffered injustices right. to just stop, you know, stop going for accountability and forgive and forget, leave things the way they are. There has to be accountability. Otherwise, oh, yeah. the cycle will continue. So I, I'm not uh, I'm not advocating for that. Oh, yeah, no, we I would I wouldn't have had you on here if I thought that, especially <laughs> not twice. You know what I'm saying? I, I I was just giving you the views and opinions of me, but Delphine, you you, you want to add on? I mean, it's, yeah. it's Black August, so we say reparations and blood, as, as George Jackson would say. But Delphine, you want to uh, yeah. stop us madmen from doing we doing okay? <laughs> yes, I, I wanted to add that you know uh, a very simple example. Uh, for example, if the mapping reports uh, recommendations had been uh, you know actioned. You know, even open and looked at and, you know, um, action because what the recommendation did like mo more than 10 years ago is still happening in Congo. You know, the people who perpetrated, who people who uh, uh, killed millions of Rwandans and Congolese in Congo, they are still doing that. You know, if they had, they, there had been justice, there had been accountability and they had stopped the perpetrators we wouldn't be talking about M23 right now. We wouldn't be talking about the same people killing the Congolese, you know, so that there's, there's um, a flow on effect that um, if, you know, if the justice was there, if the accountability was there um, and um, the, the, inv the invasion of Congo because of the, the minerals and uh, our natural resources um, is still there. Uh, so there won't be lasting peace, and and the Congo is is is, is large and and rich and everything. Uh, people who want a, a piece of it, they they are ready to sacrifice other other countries around around Congo. Unfortunately, we have some, you know, uh, leaders who are helping the, you know, that you know who are enabling that, and that, that that's the way it has to start. Yeah, I think uh, Claude said everything else, um, but um, that's the bottom line, you know. Yeah. I, I want to, um, you know, I mean, man, first and foremost, um, you know, it's, it's an honor and privilege um, to be on this platform with you all, not because you're authors of a book um, or not because you're going around speaking on the atrocities because oftentimes the one, the one, another mistake we make is uh, as our brother Daruba says, we, we come with victim led movements, right? You know, when, when folks are killed by the police in the United States, they, they bring on their family members and let's just pray about it and all that type stuff. I'm honored because of the fact that you all have not forgotten even though, like what you said earlier, Delphine, about you know your mind won't allow you to, it, it's protecting you. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's a it's a safety mechanism that kicks in. It's like, look, you saw it, but in order for you to survive and to continue to thrive and help others, then we're gonna keep that in this box over here. You understand what I'm saying? And that's a beautiful thing. But 
I'm I'm honored because you know I'm, I'm grateful to see that you all you you made it through. You know what I'm saying? You you survived. You know what I'm saying? And I can only imagine that torture and that terror. But not only that, you refuse to be quiet. And right now, I know that not only would you not be welcome in Rwanda, I wouldn't be welcome in Rwanda. You ain't got that right. You understand what I'm saying? You ain't so lying. I, so I can't even plan my vacation out there. <laughs> ain't nothing happening. You know what I'm saying? I'm <laughs> I'm sure that they would try to Britney Griner me or some shit. You know oh, what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, from afar, I say fuck the Rwandan government. You know what I'm saying? With a passion. Um, I'm and, right there and, with you. And, 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 you know, all these criminals uh, that represent and, and, and uphold this tyranny and oppression. You know, uh, you know, as Khaled Ben Wallet say, may the hours of cowards never sleep. You know, may the eyes of cowards never sleep. Um, in, in in closing, I want to uh, I want to um, first of all make a commitment to ongoing discussion and support around justice in the in in, in Rwanda, in the Congo, in Ethiopia, um, and all over the the continent and Appreciate all over that. the planet. When we talk about Africans home and abroad, I'm confused when folks talk about. You know that's not our problem and that's not our issue that doesn't that doesn't sit well with me because of the fact to me and i'm saying this and i know some people in the chat may be offended but i really don't i don't give a fuck. let me just say that quite bluntly because we're talking about war we're talking about domination destruction and death that's been um set upon all of us and we sit back and we have what we call the sidetracking of the slave. Oh, this one, you know, they ain't even from here. Or, you know, you hear, well, you know, Africans don't even respect black Americans. Well, I'm I'm not a black American. I don't know who the fuck would call themselves a black American. You understand what I'm saying? Because we were forced here into captivity. Now I know some people say, well, you know, it's it's uh, you know, we, we were here before that. We are all under this oppressive regime and uh, we're getting stomped out. Delphine, I want to ask you, how important is it for a for there to be a united Africa, um, not only in the continent, but across the globe? I understand Stand you're in Australia right now. We got you woke now. You know what I'm saying? You first came on, you're like, look, it's six o'clock. Yo, bothering me. Now you charge. So, you know, tell us, like, how important is, there, is, is it for there to be a uh, united Africa from Australia to the to Atlanta? Yeah, it's very important because um, even though you know we have we have this uh, like uh, how can I say it um, the aid or the aid that's coming actually if we had used for example the Congo there's uh, I don't remember the exact numbers but it has um, um, you know resources to feed the whole Africa and more you know so if our resources our natural resources if our brains were you put to use uh, if uh, those um, you know, bad leaders were not selling their people. Uh, we, we could have everything, could develop ourselves, we could help ourselves. Uh, so it's, it is very important for um, a united Africa so that we can um, achieve achieve that development instead of being like competing and killing each other and uh, uh, being used, manipulated. Because unfortunately, those few seeds who uh, bad leaders, and, and, and I, I'm sure the, the people who choose to use them, they know why they're choosing those particular ones. Um, they are the ones who are selling their own people. So a, a United, in United Africa would, um, would, would achieve the change, would achieve the change. Uh, and actually those people who are doing, who are kind of remote controlling you know the the movement, the controlling the the, the decisions, the the moves, the the development. You know you you can develop to this degree, but you cannot develop to the other degree. So I guess you uh, would achieve that change, the real change for our own people, and uh, it has to start with having the love for for the countries, for the love for our own people, the love for uh, you know to unite 
you know, uh, everybody. It, it would be very important because it would keep that independence, like a real independence, not um, just in words, you know, the real independence, the self-sufficiency. Um, for example, remember when we, we were refugees in Congo, there was this place where uh, th there was a very like a, like a dark soil, like a, like a, it doesn't need fertilizer, it doesn't need nothing. You can, they could just, they were just getting, um, I, I believe it was like sweet potatoes. And sometimes after you can come, there was more sweet potatoes without even making a lot of effort. There's that rich soil there's a, that can be exploited to feed the whole continent. There's so much that we can use if we're united, actually focusing on developing ourselves instead of, you know, focusing on everything else or being told how to do things. Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, you know, I agree with you, man. It, it, we're talking about the richest continent and the richest uh, region on the planet. And yet, you know, it's all of this, uh, the, this, um, you know, the, this, I mean, it's genocide. This, I mean, because the genocide isn't over. Because again, like much like the U.S. and so many other places, you know, you have political prisoners who are being tortured and who are under attack and assault. And one thing about the definition of political prisoner is you don't necessarily have to be, it's not just about your actions or your affiliations, but it's even how you think. You know what I'm saying? What you what you have to say inspiring other people can uh can 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 get you on the wrong side of the barricades. Um how can uh, folks purchase this book, Claude? Because, uh, you know, we need these book sales to go up. You know what I'm saying? We need, you know, we need more books. Um, you know, uh, we, 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 we all work on putting together a book tour here if you all don't have it already. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> appreciate year, that. Yeah, I appreciate necessary. that. Yes, yes, we, yeah. we do. We need that. Yeah. Um, so uh, right now, um, let me first just kick a shout out to all the survivors around the world, not just in Rwanda and not just in the region of all of these atrocities that um, that, that uh, marginalized people suffer. Secondly, a particular shout out to the survivors in the region and especially um, those who refuse to remain silent after surviving because that I think is a for me that's a betrayal of the people who passed. Um, I also want to kick a shout out to our co-authors. Um, we've got uh, I saw um, Urujeni Janti in the um, in the in the audience. I also saw Constance Mutimike in the audience. We also have David Dayambaje, Erin Goga, who was supposed to be here with us. Um, hope things are well with him. Um, and um, Oscar Nyangoga. Uh, as well as uh, Patrick Rugaba Sengyumva. So I wanted to kick that shout out first. Now, yes. to thank you to those of you in the chat, you know, because I know that there are uh, plenty of you in the chat as well. Yes, yes, Go ahead, yes. And, and our number one fan, uh, you and I talk show, Miss Louise Wachu. I'm pretty sure one of these days we're going to see her on this platform. Hey, um, indeed. But I, I'm looking at a comment talking about uh, your brother Kalanji is not Rwandan. He is welcome to visit Rwanda and he will get a beautiful Rwandan woman offered to him by the dictatorship to change his mind. The dictatorship can't give me nothing. <laughs> but there are stories about that in the book also. You yeah. know, that they yeah. actually use them to bribe people, um, which yeah. I, I mean, that's human trafficking. But the yeah, book itself exactly. right now, the one way to purchase it is through Amazon. Um, and um, you can purchase it at any Amazon in, in the various countries. Uh, it's Amazon Global or worldwide, the way we've got it set up. Uh, we are looking for bookstores to stock it. We've gotten uh, word from a number of bookstores uh, around in various countries, including places like England. Um, some of the places, um, I think maybe at some point soon, we may have the book stocked down in Atlanta, right down near where you are. Okay. Um, and a number of other places. Maybe, also... maybe I'll get my copy uh, when it comes to the book. <laughs> Your copy should be getting to you anytime now. <laughs> I don't know. Should have had Delphine send it, right, Delphine? 
<laughs> I was telling it since Claude's one is just taking so long. <laughs> Man, it, it, it'll probably get here from Australia. And Claude is really my next door neighbor. He still didn't get here yet. But well, go ahead. <laughs> yes. Uh, so please go to Amazon uh, right now and go and uh, and purchase the book. By the way, uh, the book did well. Um, it's still doing well in terms of African literature. Um, it's 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 been ranked in the top 100 since the book came out. Um, actually, in the top 30s for the most part. So help us get to number one. Uh, everybody in the happen. chat, everybody following, come on, get over, give it over to Amazon, purchase a copy, and that is the way to support survivors. By the way, also share this show. You know, tweet it, put it on your social media wherever you have it, Facebook, you know, Instagram, and and everywhere else. Put it out so that people know that this book is out you know share the book cover share the stories of the survivors that is the first step in actually uh supporting survivors because when you hear survive sto survivor stories you become a witness when you become a witness now you're responsible for right. actually spreading the story and preventing these things and the first step to prevention is awareness i appreciate yeah. it uh amazon uh whichever one is uh that you use in your country uh purchase a copy purchase a copy for your friend and for your family um it you know just treat it like it's uh christmas in august <laughs> treat, it, treat it like it's black august it's a revolution that's right month. black august yeah. yeah yeah um definitely uh and i and i second what claude said and uh you know everyone there should be no reason that you don't have this book in your collection you know because it is um what you all are bringing to the table is a historical uh piece you know there are certain books that everyone should own you know what i'm saying and shout out to Baina bello she has a serious book on she rose dealing with uh haitian women revolutionaries or women revolutionaries um uh during the haitian revolution so these are you know we, we bring these guests on not because you know th th they're cute you know what i'm saying and like they got a cool story to talk about we want to uh you know educate and inspire because liberation is where it's at i want to thank you uh claude and delphine for uh coming through uh this this little uh small platform that you know I, i've been trying to get claude back on here for like three years even though uh, <laughs> <laughs> every week you're like we got to repost man huh? <laughs> you're gonna keep putting me on blast here i got to man you know we do around here yeah, it's because of one of your associates, only because of Kwame. So, you know, <laughs> he's doing good. So, I, I heard I you do him. Watching. I hope yeah. Kwame's watching. Yeah, he, he probably trying to sabotage the show now. But uh, <laughs> he's watching it on his uh, on his flip phone. But definitely shout out to Kwame and Friends of the Congo. Um, definitely going to reach out to Maurice Carney as well. We've had him on the, uh, on the show before when we had uh, Patrice Lumumba's daughter on. And I definitely want to show that film. Uh, for folks to check out we can uh broadcast it um maybe you all can come back and we could do a book reading uh on the platform you know um you know maybe we could do that you know in the near future and um you know i'm looking forward to assisting as far as the organization the ftp movement assisting in making that book tour a reality as well because it's necessary uh for folks to know what time it is again thank you all claude and delphine and um <laughs> You know we'll see you soon appreciate it appreciate thank it you. thank no, you so no. much no doubt no doubt you're checking out riot started tv um and i appreciate you all coming through and kicking it with us today uh i think it was a dynamite show and i think that uh everyone should see so she just should see this show she just see this episode um make sure you share make sure you tweet it um you know and 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 let folks know about it because we love watching Hollywood versions. We'll pay to watch a Hollywood movie about the Rwandan genocide, but we won't even check it out for free when you're actually talking to the people who are not actors and who experience what's going on. So this video right here, this should get to like $30,000 because I mean, 30,000 uh, views because, um, you know, the people need to see it. So definitely appreciate you all continue to support us shout out to all of our supporters in the joint check out uh 
We'll be back on uh, here tomorrow morning. Uh, you can check out I Mix What I Like with Dr. Jared Ball. Also, we have a uh, a members-only joint we'll be doing tomorrow called Hate Mail at uh, 10 a.m. So you guys can get to talk your trash and, and, and complain about what you like and don't like and all that good stuff. And um, also on Riot Starter TV, make sure you tap in on the 30th. I will have Dr. Joyce, Dr. Joy James on. Dr. Joy James will be talking about uh, George Jackson, the prison industrial complex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Appreciate you all. You've been checking out Riot Starter TV. Share, subscribe, like, and all that good stuff. We'll be wrapping with you soon. Um, take care of yourself. Be safe out here. And uh, stay ready for revolution. Black Power Media, we out. Thank you.